Hey, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn them on to Matthew 27. Turn them on to Matthew 27, because I know that's what you got right there. <laughs> uh, we are continuing our study um, in, uh, in the series that we began five weeks ago. It's based on our, our theme for this year, Believe, and it's simply entitled, This I Believe. And we're using as an outline the uh, oldest of the Christian creeds, the Apostles' Creed. We have, uh, are using a customized version of it. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that today in the message. But it's also our annual faith declaration. We're going to make it at the end of every time together. And again, we don't make that declaration because we believe that by saying something, it's, it becomes a reality. That's what witches do, right? We say that hopefully from the bottom of our hearts because we truly believe that. When we, when we, what we believe in our hearts comes out of our mouth, that becomes reality in our lives, okay? And that's what we are talking about. So if you missed any of the previous messages, please catch up on them on our website, our, our, um, app, um, uh, at a, on YouTube channel. Uh, you've got to catch up on them because all of them build on each other. What is it? Why is it we're doing this? Because our faith, our belief, our trust is not on some religious creed. It's on a person. It's on the person of who God is. And when we know who God is, it's going to make a huge difference in our lives. It's going to make all the difference in our lives. When we know who he is and what he's done for us, then we'll know who we are and what we're supposed to do, right? And, I, and I've quoted Tozer several times. Well, what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. It'll impact every aspect of your life. In fact, you will not know who you are, truly know who you are, until you know who God is. You, wanna, you want the right identity. If you want true identity. And listen, we know in this world that one of the things that is being attacked by the enemy is identity. If you want your identity be, to be based on facts and reality and, and what God has declared, you need to know who God is. And as, you need, as, you, as we go through this, I am, I'm praying that God will just get a hold of our hearts in such a way that we will end up, I believe this is one of the most important series of messages that we've ever done here at this church because it is so foundational to who we are, what we believe, and who our God is that we trust. The more we know him, the more we're going to love him, and the more we're going to trust him, and the greater things he's going to do in us and through us, right? So today, we're still in the person of Jesus Christ. We're in studying the person of who he is and what he has done on our behalf. And so I'm going to include in, in this, in, in today, what he, what we started last week in this. This is a statement we're looking at from the Apostles' Creed. I believe in Jesus Christ, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he arose from the dead. So let's pray. I ask the Holy Spirit to help you this morning. Father, thank you so much for this moment, this time that you give us to gather together as your people, God. This isn't just a natural gathering. This is a supernatural gathering because where two or three are gathered, you're there supernaturally in our midst. And so we're thankful for that, Lord. You've taken a seat right by us. And I pray, God, that your presence, both here in this building today and, and in the homes all across our community that are right now watching online, I pray that your presence would be so strong that it would lead us and guide us into this truth that is so vitally important for us to grasp. We need your help. We can't do it on our own. So Holy Spirit, help us. Open the, eye, the eyes of our hearts. Let our hearts be enlightened to your truth. Give us the spirit of wisdom and understanding that we would grasp who you are and who we are because of you. And I pray it all in the mighty name of Jesus. And if you love the Lord, say amen. So come on, let's say this together. I believe in Jesus Christ, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he arose from the dead. Now last week, we covered in length, and we got into a little bit more detail into how Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, right? And how he was flogged, and how he was sent to the cross, and, 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 he was, and he died, he really died, and he really was buried, right? And again, if you missed any of those messages, catch up on them. But today I want to look at two truths regarding his resurrection that we need to understand. Two aspects of his resurrection, two vital truths that we must grasp in order for us to walk in confidence, in order for us to walk in the faith that God has given us, okay? But before we look at his resurrection, I want to go back to the cross, 
I want to go back to the cross because without the cross, the resurrection is meaningless. And without the resurrection, the cross is meaningless. I want you to understand that. If all you believe is in the cross without the resurrection, then we can esteem Jesus and we can honor him for his sacrifice and we can say how awesome he was that he would lay down his life for us, but that would be the end of it. If all we focus is on the resurrection, then we can say, wow, there is a man today who is living forever and ever and ever. And he has always, he's, he's, from the time he was resurrected, he's been alive and he's still alive today. But it would not impact us in any way if we don't tie it to the cross. So the cross and the resurrection must always come together. The cross and the resurrection must be vitally important in our lives for it to actually the truth of who he is and what he has done for us actually impact us, not just now, but in the future, okay? So I want to look at verse 45. Start in Matthew 27, verse 45. Go back to the cross because this is something that we need to grasp, understand. Again, we, we'll pick up, he's been brutally beaten. He's been savagely beaten beyond description. The Bible says he didn't even look like a human being as he was hung, uh, nailed to that cross, naked on that cross. He's there between two thieves. The passerbys are still going and, and hur hurling all kinds of insults to him. And they're, they're, they're shaming him beyond the shame of the cross. And in verse 45, it says this, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. Notice it's from noon until three. Three hours of utter darkness. I want to pause there for just a moment because last week, I talked to you about the historicity of Christ's death and burial and resurrection, right? His, 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 it's a point in history. It's fact. It's been proven, right? Proven. Here's another example of that truth because when you, when you look at history, secular historians of the day have been quoted and actually some have survived and every one of them have spoken of this anomaly that occurred in this point in history where darkness ac across the entire globe, darkness engulfed creation for three hours. Now the, the ancient historians, they, they described it as a solar eclipse, but it was far beyond the solar eclipse let me just give you one instance. A solar eclipse, the most, science today has proven this, the most that a, a solar eclipse can last is 7 minutes and 31 seconds. That is the longest it can possibly last. The longest recorded history of a solar eclipse happened in 1973. I remember. Yeah, I'm that old. <laughs> and it lasted 7 minutes and 4 seconds. This darkness came over the entire globe for three full hours. Again, I bring that up because it's just another moment in human history that verifies the veracity, the, the truth of the biblical account that we're reading today. Our faith is based on facts, not fables. Look at verse 46. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and, and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. And the, the rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he voluntarily gave up his spirit. In John's testimony of the crucifixion, right before he gave up his spirit, he cried out in a loud voice, to Telestai, it is finished. Literally, it is paid in full. In verse 51, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That's symbolic of the fact that now we have access to God directly. There's nothing, there's no barrier to the believers in Christ going straight to the throne room of God, okay? The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. Historical records and geological discoveries and studies have, have found that there actually happened, an earthquake occurred at that time in history, again, proving that it's real. Verse 54, when the centurion 
and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed. Here's a pagan describing and exclaiming, surely he was the son of God. I changed that to say, surely he is the son of God. Now, we're going to look at his resurrection, but before we do that, I want us to look at one aspect of what happened on the cross as Jesus atoned for our sins that we must understand. Those of you who are familiar with the traditional Apostles' Creed know that I omitted one phrase from our version that we, that we declare at the end of our time together. I left out the, the phrase that says, he descended into hell. Let me give you three reasons why I did that, okay? Number one, to avoid confusion. Just like I changed the words from Holy Catholic Church in the communion of the saints, and I changed it to what it means, but I changed the words. Because I didn't want every time that we said that, listen, I will explain it to you today, and next week we'll have 300 more people that need to be explained again. Right? So rather than explain it every week, so what are we Catholic? No, no, Catholic means universal. We believe in saints? No, saints are not St. Jerome and St. Bernard. and it's, it's, it's the people of God that have been set apart for the glory of God. That's what it means. The communion is not when we do the Lord's Supper. Communion is that, is that relationship, that unity, that union that we have with one another being the body of Christ. Now, I just explain it to you. I don't want to explain it again next week and the week after that and the one after. So for, for sense of confusion, for the sake of confusion, to avoid confusion, I just changed those words. Can I get an amen? amen. The second reason I changed it is because the, the, the phrase descended into hell was actually added several hundred years after the original creed was formulated. So I thought, you know what? If it wasn't part of the original, let's, let's remove it, okay? But here's the main reason that I changed it. And I omitted it. I, in my studies of the scriptures, cannot find any solid scriptural evidence to confidently confess it as a settled truth, okay? There are a couple of Bible verses that allude to it possibly happening, but nothing so concrete that it removes any other interpretations of those verses. So if I just look at the Bible and what it teaches, I cannot with a clear conscience say this is exactly what happened between Jesus' death and his resurrection. Okay, does that make sense? But what I can go on and what I can believe regarding where Jesus went between his death on the cross, his burial, and his resurrection is what Jesus himself said. And in Luke 23, it tells us that one of the thieves on the cross beside Jesus expressed remorse, expressed repentance, and actually confessed Jesus as king. He said, remember me when you enter into your kingdom, which speaks of the fact that he believed that even though this man was dying on the cross, he was innocent, but he was going to live again and that he was going to come as king. And Jesus said to him, Today, you will be with me, where? In paradise. Now, hell is Gehenna, which is for the lost. Paradise is for the saved. So I think I can confidently say this. I can say with confidence that Jesus, because of what he did on the cross, went where every true believer who dies today goes. Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So I believe he went to the presence of God along with the righteous saints that had died in the Old Testament. Now he had paid their price. Now he were able to join him in paradise to await the resurrection of the body. Okay? Now, I say all that to say that there is a nugget of truth in that phrase that I want to come back to. Not that he descended into hell, but that he actually experienced hell. Because we know that Jesus died in our place on the cross. He was our substitute on the cross. The death we deserved, the hell we deserved, he took upon himself on the cross. We saw last week that he provided atonement for our sin, redemption for our sins, and reconciled us to God. 
And everyone who believes in him, that atonement, that reconciliation, that redemption becomes theirs, okay? He took upon the cross the sentence that we deserve for our sin. The sentence for sin is death. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, a true believer in Jesus, Christ experienced hell for you on the cross. He finished the full payment of our sins, including the hell we deserve on the cross. When he said it is finished, he said it's paid in full. I don't have to add any more to it. It's done on the cross, on the cross. And that's why in some way, by some means, in the mystery of divine omniscience, in the mystery of divine omnipotence, somehow, some way, for the first time in the history of the universe, there is this separation between Jesus, the Son of God, and God the Father. There is this type of, of God the Father turning his back and separating, for the first time ever, his back on the Son. So for the first and only time in scripture, we read Jesus speaking to God and he doesn't call him father. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? Listen, the agony of separation from the father at this moment settles into the son. And for the first time ever, he feels what we were, were never, ever created to feel. Separation from God. That's the hell Christ experienced for you and for me. See, what hell is, is very simple. Hell is an internal separation from God and his goodness. If I were to start a sentence by saying, God is, how would you finish it? God is, God is good. The very essence of who God is, the very foundation, the axiom of our life is that God is good. And hell is hell because God is not there. And because God is not there, his goodness is not there. Jesus experienced that hell for us. Listen to me. Everything good, Everything that is good, absolutely everything good that you experience on this earth is a gift of God's common grace that is brought about by the presence of God because God is good. Even the most heinous and despicable human being that has ever lived or will ever live on this earth benefit from the goodness of God. For example, a righteous farmer and an evil farmer will both benefit from the goodness of rain on their crops. But that's not what happens in hell. All goodness is absent in hell because God is absent in hell. And Jesus on that cross, the perfect son of God, the Bible says he became a curse for us. He became sin on our behalf. And God is so holy, he cannot be in the presence of sin. Therefore, he turned his back and, he, and Jesus experienced the reality of hell on our behalf. And that's why you have to say it's no wonder that creation responded to this, this moment in history by going fully dark and shaking in terror. Now, that's what he experienced for us. That's how he paid the full price. Now, once the work of our salvation was completed, he was reconciled to the Father, just like we are reconciled to him. Why? Because he looked at the Father and he said, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And he died and was buried. But he didn't stay buried. Come on, turn to somebody and say, he didn't stay buried. Matthew 28, after the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. I love that picture. 
I just love that picture of a rolling it and sitting on that, kind of crossing his legs a little bit, just kind of. And his appearance was like lightning. And his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him, these Roman guards, that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. Come on, say it with me. He's not here. He has risen just as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Let me prove it to you. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. Have you ever felt that way? Afraid yet filled with joy. A little anxious but filled with joy. Worried but filled with joy. That's what the resurrection of Christ does for you. And he says they ran in to tell his disciples and suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. <laughs> and they came to him, clasped his what? His feet and did what? And worshipped him and Jesus didn't stop him because God is worthy of worship. And Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. On the third day, he arose from the dead. I said, on the third day, he arose from the dead. Now, now, when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus, let me just give you these two truths that we need to grasp today. Again, we have to understand it here for it to move from here to where? To here. If we don't understand it here, we can't believe it here. So, but don't let it stay here. Let it move to here. Here's the first one I want to highlight. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was a bodily, physical resurrection. Say that with me. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was a bodily, physical resurrection. He died, he went to the tomb, and he came back to life. Listen to me. He did not come back a ghost. He wasn't some spirit that, that the women encountered at the tomb. He resurrected in bodily, physical form. When we read what the Bible records about his resurrection, it tells us that for 40 days after his resurrection, he appeared multiple times to his disciples. And what do we read he did during those appearances? In John chapter 20, we see him cooking, a, cooking fish. He was having a fish fry. And he invited his disciples to eat with him. He ate fish with his disciples. Here's the resurrected Jesus eating a physical meal with his physical body. The Bible tells us that he had scars on his body that could be touched. Literally touched. Uh, 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 the, the hole from the thrust of the spear that Thomas was able to actually put his hand into. We read earlier that the women touched his feet. In Acts 1.9 it's not some ghost that ascends to heaven. It is Jesus and his physical resurrected body that ascends into heaven to the right hand of the Father. And he will return in a physical body. I say that because I don't want us to understand, to let fantasy take over from and, and, and keep you from the physicality of Jesus' real body. He's alive. He was alive and he is alive. And he's alive in a resurrected physical body that does not perish, does not get weak, and cannot die. But he physically arose from the grave. And let me tell you why this is so important. First of all, because we have a tendency to separate physicality from our faith. We all have a tendency to separate physicality from our faith. We tend to make everything about our faith otherworldly and spiritual. How many have ever heard the phrase, he is so heavenly minded that he's no earthly good? What that means is that everything is spiritual. Everything is ethereal. Everything is otherworldly. And what happens then is that we neglect the reality of the real presence of the real person who Jesus is. Now, it doesn't help that we live in a society that practices watching people from afar and dealing with people from afar. 
I don't have to convince you there are people today that have friends that are totally virtual. Totally virtual. They communicate with them every day via headsets, iMessages, or chat boxes. We have millions of people connecting with millions of people in a virtual reality instead of a physical reality. And here's what happens. People lose their peopleness. I made that word up. But I think you understand what I'm saying. What I mean is this, that we live in a world where people lose their humanity and become a commodity. I'm going to say that again. We live in a world where people use, lose their humanity and become a commodity. And, it, and it's not relegated to just people. It's relegated to Jesus. See, the humanness of people created in the image of God is lost. I'm telling you right now, it's being lost more than ever. And that's why our culture has absolutely no problem. In fact, our culture is so comfortable tearing other people down because people are not seen as real people. They exist as a commodity for us to be used. For us to use. A commodity to be used to make our life better, to make my me feel better, to somehow gain some entertainment from them or by some other means. So we look at Jesus and he's no longer a real person. He's a commodity that we can use to make my life better. To entertain me. To make me feel better. And this is something that we deal with all the time in our world. I was having a conversation with a young couple in the... In the um, in the lobby a, a few weeks back and we were talking about the hard knocks um show that's on hbo i watched the pg version by the way i don't i actually have to wait three days before i can watch it because some of those guys are really potty mouths but i was saying what what that show does is because we look at nfl players let's just look at it as an illustration and you know i remember when tony romo was still quarterback for the for the dallas cowboys and dude, the guy got ripped left and right. He was talked about like one day he's great, the next day he's horrible, he's a piece of garbage. Blah, blah. Friends, that's a human being. We look at those players as commodities and we forget they're human beings. That's what we're used to doing. And I was saying that, that, that Hard Knocks show actually brings the humanity out of these players, you watch them and you see them crying when they get hurt and, and they're, you know, they're out for the rest of the season and you see what they're, go what's going on in their homes with their families and, and what they've gone through to get to where they are. And it actually brings back the, the reality. These are not commodities. These are not little people on a screen that we can just talk about and, and tear down. These are real human beings created in the image of God. And the point I'm trying to make is that because we live in this kind of society, even as believers in Christ, we fall into this mindset of making spiritual things kind of ethereal and otherworldly and miss out on the reality that Jesus is alive physically right now. He's a real person. He's a real person. Don't let Jesus become an idea or a doctrine or some kind of alien to you. He's not an X-Man. He didn't sprout wings. He didn't become an angel. That's not who he is. He is a real human being with a perfect physical body. He was God in the flesh when he walked this earth. He is God in the flesh right now at the right hand of the Father. And he will be God in the flesh when he comes back for you and me. He's real. Turn to somebody and tell me he's real. He's not a virtual savior. He's a real savior. He's a real king. Now, since the resurrection of Christ was a physical, bodily resurrection, that impacts you and me big time. Big time. And I'm going to show you how. I'm going to go into a little bit down the road when we believe in the resurrection of the dead. But this has, I can't preach and teach you on the resurrection of Jesus without tying in to this point. Our confidence in the fact 
that our sins have been paid for and our sentence of death has been fully settled is unshakable. Because Jesus arose from the dead physically, our confidence in our salvation should be unshakable. No one can convince us otherwise. No demon of hell should instill any kind of doubt in our hearts or minds when it comes to our salvation because of what the resurrection means. Again, if he hadn't risen from the dead, then we have a problem. If Jesus is still dead, then our confidence in his perfection, our confidence in his righteousness, our confidence in his deity, our confidence in his holiness, all of that that God has done for us, it will be radically shaken. It will shake us to our core. Because if the cost of, death, of sin is death, and death has not been defeated, friends, then we have questions about whether or not our bill has been paid in full. Maybe he just paid half of it off. He couldn't have paid it all off if he's still dead. But because Christ is not dead, because he arose on the third day, our confidence is that the totality of our salvation and all that entails was fully paid when Christ died on the cross. On the cross, he declared it. It is finished. It is paid in full. The payment has been made in full. And then he proved that it has been paid when he arose from the dead on the third day. I'm going to put it to you this way so that we can understand it. The cross is the payment. The empty tomb is the receipt. Come on, declare that with me. The cross is the payment. The empty tomb is a receipt. Come on, somebody's tried to return something before. Let me see the receipt. Did you really pay this? Did you really buy this? The receipt proves that the payment's been made. Every time the devil tries to make you doubt who Jesus is, you remember that tomb. There it is. That's, that tomb is empty. That's my receipt that my, my sins, my salvation, the hell that I deserve has been paid in full by my Savior, by my Lord, by Jesus. The reality, friends, that our sins have been paid for, that our salvation has been, has been paid in full and, and it's proven by the resurrection, it impacts our lives. It doesn't just impact our lives for our future heaven. There are people, believers all across this globe, and all they think is that Jesus' death and resurrection, all it does is give you a ticket into heaven. Friends, it's so much more than that. There is a future for us, but it impacts our lives right now. Right now, it impacts our lives. See, for, for those of us who truly believe from our hearts, like we saw in the first message, from our hearts, we believe that he died in the cross. We believe that he was buried. We believe that he rose again on the third day. We believe that our sins have been paid for. For those of us who truly believe Christ's physical resurrection not only secures a future resurrection for his people someday, but also secures a present resurrection for his people right now. Leave that up for a little bit because I want you to look at that. Christ's physical resurrection not only secures a future resurrection for his people someday. We don't know when the day is, but it's coming. But it also secures a present resurrection for his people right now. That means that as his people who have had our debts paid for in full by Jesus, we are both raised and will be raised. We are risen and we will rise. Here's what I mean by that in Ephesians 2. Once you were dead. What tense is that? That's past tense. Once you were dead because of what? Of your disobedience and your what? Many sins. You used to live. He's talking to believers in Christ. Those that truly have believed in the gospel of Jesus. You used to live in sin. Just like the rest of the world, obeying whom? The devil, 
who is the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to believe, and because they don't believe, they don't obey God. All of us believers in Christ used to, used to live that way, following the passionate desires and the inclinations of our sinful nature, what we were born with. We talked about that during the incarnation teaching. By our very nature, by our nature, we were subject to God's anger, to God's wrath, to God's judgment, just like what? Everyone else. But then we have the two most beautiful words ever written. But God. Come on, somebody say that. But God. But God is so rich in mercy. And he loved us so much that he, even though we were dead, we were dead because of our sins. We were dead because of our sins. He gave us life when, when, when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you've been saved. For he raised us. He raised us from the dead along with Christ. That's past tense, friends. He raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. Because why? Because why? We are united. We are united with Christ Jesus. Part of that is next week's sermon. But I want you to go back to that verse a second. I want you to see this the word united. That is more than just a supermarket. <laughs> that is the essence of our salvation. God united us to Christ. So important to understand that. And because he's united, you're united, I'm united. If we are united to Christ, then we are united to each other. That word is so huge. United with Christ. Because we were united with Christ, we were raised when he was raised. Right? Verse 7. So God can point to us in all future ages. Look what I've done. Look what my son has purchased. As examples of the incredible wealth. That's who you are in Jesus. Example of his incredible wealth, of his grace and kindness toward us. As shown in all he has done, what? For us. Who are what? United with Christ Jesus. See, as believers in Christ, we have experienced a spiritual resurrection. Come on, say it together. As believers in Christ, we have experienced a spiritual resurrection. The Bible teaches us very clearly. We were dead. We weren't just sick in our sins. We were dead in our sins. But God, through Christ's resurrection, made us alive. That's past tense. We became alive. We were dead, but now we're not. We were dead, but now we're not. The moment we believe in Jesus from our hearts, God takes us and he unites us with Christ Jesus. Paul says in Romans 6 that it's like we were baptized into Christ. We were baptized into Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. You know the, the old Nelson? You know where he is? You know where the old Nelson is? He's crucified on the cross with Jesus 2,000 years ago. Because the moment I came to Christ, he united me to Jesus and the old man died on that cross. That old man was buried with Christ. But a new man came out. A new man came out of that ground along with a new man, Jesus. That's what he's done to everyone who truly believes in Jesus. You've been united and his resurrection has caused a spiritual resurrection in your life. If you haven't experienced a spiritual resurrection, you're still dead. You're still dead. And the same thing he said, all the passions are for the world and all the desires are for sin. And, 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 the, and the voice that you listen to without even realizing is the devil's. But when you come to life in Christ, that dead man's done. He's gone. He's done. 
and we become a brand new creation in Christ Jesus, we have been raised, right? What does that mean? Why is that important for us to understand? Because our spiritual resurrection assures us of a victorious life now. Now. Come on, say it with me. Our spiritual resurrection assures us of a victorious life now. That's the whole point of Romans chapter 6. That's the whole point Paul's making. He's saying, guys, listen, because your old lives have died on the cross, because your old lives were buried with Jesus, because your old lives were gone, are now gone, and your new life is now available to you because you have risen with Christ through his resurrection, you don't have to live defeated lives anymore overcome by sin. You don't have to. We have victory over sin. We have victory. We are no longer slaves to sin. There was a time when we were slaves to sin. As a believer in Christ, that is no longer the case. Why? Because you have experienced a spiritual resurrection. God, that is amazing. Friends, that is amazing news that we need to grasp. Paul says in Romans, he says in Romans 6, he says, listen, consider this. Consider yourself dead to sin, but alive to Christ. He says, you got to get it in your heart and soul. You have to understand this. We have the power to say no to sin in a way we never had before we were spiritually resurrected. We have a new perspective on sin. We no longer welcome it. We no longer ignore it. And we no longer bow the knee to it. Our relationship to sin has changed. Let me put it to you this way. We used to be dead in our sin. Now we are dead to our sin. Let that sink in. In fact, say it with me. We used to be dead in our sin. Now we are dead to our sin. When you've been made spiritually alive, all of a sudden, sin disgusts you. When you've been made spiritually alive, the sin that you used to wallow in and enjoy now starts to smell like decay. It smells putrid because that's what it is. The rot of sin. And I don't know about you, but when I smell something rotten, I turn away from it. Come on. Everybody has a, every one of us has picked up a jug of milk from the, from the refrigerator. You open it up and you're like, ah. we don't go, it smells rotten. It smells spoiled. If you do, you're something wrong with you. But when you become a believer in Christ, when you're resurrected from the dead, you see the thing that caused you to be dead as ugly, as disgusting, and you turn away from it. You can't do that when you're not a believer in Christ. When you're not a believer in Christ, that's your life. That was my life before I came to Jesus. I didn't see it as putrid. I thought it was cool. I thought it was fun. And I didn't realize the entire time that it was putting me deeper and deeper into slavery, deeper and deeper into bondage, and deeper and deeper destroying my life and everything around me. But as a believer in Christ, we don't have to deal with sin that way anymore. We can see it for what it is. We have victory over it. Friends, we've been raised to victory. We have been raised to victory. We have victory over sin. We have victory over the fear of death. We have victory over self. We have victory over every evil principality and power that has ever existed. Our spiritual resurrection assures for us a victorious life when? Now. But not only do believers in Christ experience a spiritual resurrection right now, as believers in Christ, we will experience a physical resurrection in the future. We are both raised and will be raised. We are both risen and will rise. Okay? And the greatest passage of Christ, on Christ's resurrection and how it impacts us, how it affects us as believers in Christ is 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to read quite a bit of this. How many are okay with reading a lot of scripture? You better be. Look at verse 19. And if our hope in Christ 
is only for this life. He's writing to people who are actually denying the resurrection of Jesus, doubting the resurrection of Jesus. They thought, oh, we can be saved even though Jesus didn't raise from the dead. And he's saying, that's impossible. You got to recognize you can't separate the cross from the, from the resurrection, from the empty tomb, right? He says, if our hope is in Christ right now for this life only, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, not in fable, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. And when he says all who have died, he's, he's, the context is all who believe in Christ, all the true followers of Jesus. Not every, it's not universalism where everybody's going to be raised and God took care of it. No, no. It's those who have put their trust in Jesus, okay? He says, listen, he's just the first of another great harvest of those who have died in Christ Jesus. In verse 21, it says, so you see, just as death came into the world through a man, what was that man's name? Now the resurrection from the dead has come, has begun, has begun, he began it, through another man. Who's that man? Jesus. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given what? New life. But there's an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first, everybody say first, of the harvest. He's the first fruits of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised. That's our physical resurrection our, when he comes back. When, when will it happen? When he comes back. And we don't know when that will happen. That can happen before this service is over. Right? And Paul goes on in this passage to give several illustrations from nature to help us understand this body we're going to get. To help us understand this resurrection he's talking about that our future hinges on. If we don't believe we're going to be raised from the dead, then all we have is right now. But because... Our future resurrection is still to come. How do we know? Because Jesus is risen from the dead. He says it's going to be a little different. And he gives illustrations. And so what he says is this. He says, listen, I'm going to give you some illustrations from nature. And what he is basically laying out is this. You need to pay attention here. Put your thinking caps on. He says, listen, there's, a, there's, there's the same substance or essence in the things of nature that can take on a different quality yet still be the same substance at its core. Follow with me. One of those illustrations he uses is that of a planted seed. And he says, when you plant a seed, when you sow a seed, that seed changes, but not in substance. It turns into something a little different. It's still the same substance, but now it has greater value, greater quality a superiority in the form that it takes okay let me give you an example how many how many can just live off one kernel of corn let me see your hand how many appreciate one kernel of corn like if you sat down for for lunch today and you you go to to compact and you order corn and they bring you one kernel how would you feel about that and it's not even cooked it's still like hard right so it's is it corn yeah, it's still the substance, the essence of that kernel is corn. But when you plant that seed, that kernel of corn, it begins to change in the, in, the, in, the, in the ground. It rots, it starts to open up, it grows into a stalk of ears of corn. Now, how many would say that the ears of corn are much better, more valuable, and much more superior than to a kernel of corn, yet it's still the same substance? Still the same essence. Corn, corn. Make sense? Now Paul says, understand this is what your resurrection is going to be like. Our future resurrection. Not our spiritual, but our physical one. He says in verse, 50, verse 42, so will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown perishable, it is raised imperishable. The body is sown in dishonor, but that body is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, but it is raised a spiritual what? Body. It does not say raised a spirit. We are not raised as ghosts. Please erase from your mindset this idea that somehow when we die we grow wings and become angels we don't become angels nor are we beautiful flowers planted in somebody's garden 
He says, you're going to be raised with a body. Believers in Christ are raised with a real spiritual body at the resurrection. It's a new kind of body, but the same substance as essence that was buried. The same substance and essence that was, that was planted, right? And he says, for just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. The scripture tells us the first man, Adam, became a living person, but the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. Now listen, in all of this conversation of the spiritual, do not divorce the spiritual from the physical. Don't divorce the spiritual from the physical. He's talking about a physical yet spiritual resurrected body that can be seen, that can be touched. One, a body that has all its physical traits, yet it is superior in quality. It's superior in function and in value. What he is doing is he is distinguishing between the bodies we have now and the bodies we'll have when we are raised from the dead. The bodies and how they correlate to Jesus. How do they tie into Jesus' resurrection? He says this in verse 46, what comes first is the natural body. We all have natural bodies. That's what, came, that's what we were born with. That came first. Then the spiritual body comes later. That's for the resurrection of the dead, the believers in Christ. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from where? From heaven. And this ties into our, again, to our teaching on the incarnation a few weeks back. But here's the key verse. <clears throat> here's the key verse, verse 48. Earthly people are like the earthly man. Who's the earthly man? Adam. And heavenly people are like the heavenly man. Who's that? Jesus. Just as we are now like the earthly man, say that last part with me, we will someday be like the heavenly man. Why is that a key verse? Because it teaches us this, that our resurrected body will be like Christ's resurrected body. Come on, say that with me. Our resurrected body will be like Christ's resurrected body. If you want to know what your resurrected body will be like, look at Christ's resurrected body in the Gospels. What his body did, ours will do. And why do we need this new kind of physical body? Why do we need this superior physical body? Why do we need this new quality of a body? Well, he answers that in verse 50. He says, what I'm saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. I like how the voice translates it. Now listen to this. Brothers and sisters, this present body, somebody do this. Sorry, forgot that I had a microphone there. This present body is not able to inherit the kingdom of God any more than decay can inherit that which lasts forever. What's he saying? Why, does, why do we have to get new bodies? Why do we have to have a new quality, a new superiority in our bodies? Why? Because these bodies are, of ours are not capable of heaven. Our temporal bodies are not made for eternity. We don't have right now the right kind of body to live forever. And something that is dying cannot exist in a place where there is no death. I'll put it to you this way. Our earthly body must be transformed into a heaven-worthy body. Say it with me. Our earthly body must be transformed into a heaven-worthy body. So it's like, okay, that's awesome. But will it happen? Can I believe that to, to really? Yes. Let me tell you something. God has given us his word that he will do this. He will do this for everyone who has put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the resurrected one. Because he rose from the dead, we know that his word for us is yes and amen for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he tells us this in the same chapter. He says, let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die. So even if you're alive when Jesus comes back, 
we will all be transformed. That's what we pray for. It's like, oh, God, God, let it, that be me. Right? He says all of us will be transformed. We need that body. Whether we've died or we're alive, when he comes back, we're going to get that body. But it will happen in a moment. In the blink. I like the translation, in a twinkling of an eye. So quick that you can't even blink. When the last trumpet is blown, for when the trumpet sounds, those who have died in Christ will be raised to live forever, and we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is a sting that results in death and the law gives sin to its, po its power. But thank God he gives us what church? Victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Can somebody shout hallelujah to that truth? My hope is not just for today as one who has been raised spiritually. My hope is also for 10,000 years from now when I will be ruling and reigning alongside of Jesus Christ, the risen one, as an, with an immortal body that he alone has given me. I have been raised, but thank God I will be raised. Amen? Amen. Listen, I, I'm 62 years old. And I know I've already started the descent. <laughs> I've come to grips that I will never be any more athletic. I will never be any faster. I will never be able to play football again <laughs> without getting something hurt. I will never have more hair in all the right places. Listen, I'm not even at cruising altitude at 62. Everything from here is just a bit of a descent. And for me to lie to myself is denial. And some of us are already learning this. For me, it's dangerous to sleep. I mean, I go to bed feeling for great. And I wake up with some kind of new pain. <laughs> what happened to my neck while I was sleeping? Wait, wait, wait. wait. My, my knee was feeling fine when I went to bed. Listen, that didn't happen to me when I was a kid. This perishable body of mine is perishing. And friends, listen to me very carefully. Gravity always wins at the end. Always. And, and I'm not saying this for you not to be a good steward of this body. Listen, this is the only body we have right now that is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we need to be good stewards of these bodies of ours. We need to treat it with dignity. Right? Right? Because it's this body that's going to be transformed and changed into a new body. But when it's all said and done, friends, here's the reality. This body will betray you. It will fall apart. It's going to get sick. I don't care how much you confess it. It's going to get sick. It's going to grow weaker. And it's not going to do what you want it to do. Your brain says yes. Your body says no way. It's perishing. It's perishing. When it perishes... It will be sown into the ground with dishonor. If this body perishes before Jesus comes back, it will be sown into the ground with dishonor. Nobody dies pretty. Nobody does. Death is an ugly, ugly thing that we were never, ever meant to experience. But for the believer in Jesus Christ, the resurrected one, that's not the end. That is not the end. One day... The trumpet's going to sound. One day, this body that was perishable when buried will be raised imperishable. It was sown in dishonor, but it will be raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but thank God it will be raised in power. It's sown a mortal dead body, but it will be raised an immortal spiritual body. How do I know that's going to happen? 
How can I believe with every fiber of my being that this too will be my lot in heaven one day? Because I believe in Jesus Christ. On the third day, he arose from the dead. He arose from the dead. I believe that with all of my heart. And because he lives, I live. I live today being raised from the dead spiritually. And I will live tomorrow being raised from the dead physically. Our hope is not just for today. Our hope is also for tomorrow. So can you stand with me? Because Christ is alive, friends. No matter what I face in this world, I can face it. I don't know what your tomorrow is going to look like. None of us knows what's looming on the horizon for us. But because Jesus is alive, our fears about tomorrows should dissipate, should disappear, should take their proper places. Why? Because he has us. He's not against us. He is for us. Friends, he is alive. He's not some idea somewhere. He's real. He's alive. We have no enemy. You know why? Because death is dead. He conquered death. Sin is vanquished. The power of sin has been vanquished in our lives. Friends, look at the end of the book. We won. We've already won. The battle and the war has been won by Jesus. And since we know who holds our future, there is rest and there is peace in this world right now that this world can never give us. And that peace begins at the moment of our surrender to Jesus as our Lord and King. If he's not the king of your life, if you haven't put your full trust and belief, your faith in him, then you're still dead. You're dead. You need a spiritual resurrection today. And it's as simple as a heartfelt prayer to the risen one. That you say, I surrender to you. I recognize you as the king. And I surrender to you as king. Admit that you're dead in your sin. That you need him to save you. That you need a new life that only he can give. And God is so gracious. But God. But God in his mercy. But God in his grace. Because of what his son has done for us. He will forgive you. He will accept you as his own. And he will provide for you hope today. But a hope for tomorrow. Through the resurrection of Jesus. You know there's this one chorus. When I first was raised from the dead spiritually. And my life was like, like hell on earth. Now I was experiencing a pain that I would not wish on anyone ever to experience. When my entire world had fallen apart. And I was going to a dead church. And someone invited me to a, a live church. And the first time I walked into that church and sensed the presence of God, something broke inside of me. And I will never forget the chorus that we sang that day is the one we're going to sing right now. Because when I began to sing that chorus, I recognized I have a resurrected Savior. I have a resurrected King. And no matter what we go through in this world, no matter how tough it is, no matter how painful, no matter how much suffering we have to go through, and we will, we can face tomorrow because our Savior is alive.